course, we're going to break the 1.5 degree without any sweat. And the question is whether it'll be three or four ministries of finance don't have ecologists there or soil experts or they have economists, of course. But they're the last people you would go to to have a depreciation of the inner workings of nature. Welcome to Monga Bay Sessions. I'm your host, Gopi Krishna Warrior, Managing Editor of Monga Bay India. In this series, we will be interviewing leading conservation players in India on their experiences and their ideas to make the world a better place. Welcome to Monga Bay Sessions. I have with me Professor Sir Partha Dasgupta, eminent environmental economist. Sir Partha is Frank Ramsey Professor Emeritus of Economics at the University of Cambridge in the UK. He has been an academic and policy advisor of international repute for decades and also a promoter of environmental economics professional bodies in India and South Asian region. In February 2021, he authored the landmark the Economics of Biodiversity, also known more famously as the Daskipta Re Review, on request from the Treasury Department of the UK, UK government. He was named as one of the four champions of Earth during the 2022 by, by the United Nations Environment Programme. Sir Partha, thank you for your time. Welcome to Monga Bay Sessions. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, Sir Partha, we, we are having this conversation when the international community is preparing to meet in Dubai for the Climate Change Conven uh, Convention Conference of Parties. Again this year, like the previous years, uh, the issue of climate finance and loss of damage fund are going to take center stage. While one can argue that these are environmental economics uh, discussions, but uh, why is it that even after two decades from the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment Report and the, the deep and more recently your Tasgupta review, the economics of value, uh, economic value of biodiversity and ecosystem services has not come into mainstream discussions. Wow, that's that's a tough question to answer, and I can nibble at it at best, and probably will be misguided. But I'll have a whack at it. Obviously, I've thought about it a lot, and that doesn't mean I've come to any firm conclusions as to why. Well, first of all, I should say that one reason I'm less than fully impressed with the discussions with on the way the economics of climate change has developed is that it has seen climate regulation, uh, I mean nature's, mother nature's regulation of climate the, as the one service that she offers us. So the technique that's been followed in developing the entire di discussion, debate, on climate change, the economics of climate change. I'm talking about the economics of it now, not the science of climate change. I have no questioning that. Is that it's it's planted a climate model as being the sole service provider onto a conventional model of economic growth and development, which has no nature in it. So the one one piece of nature that occurs in the normal models is is, is is in the climate models is the climate. And the reason I think that subject has taken off in the sense that at least people can discuss it and and you know we've had many cops on it. Now what, what by re agreement may have t been slow to take is a different matter. I'll come to that in a minute, but the reason that nobody's questioning the the language in which the uh, discussion is taken is that climate also enables you to think of clean alternative energy sources. So the thought here is that if you spend enough money, and the enough money could be, say, 2% of GDP, global GDP at best per year, then over a 10, 15, 20-year period, you can transition to clean technology. And the sense that your net emissions can become zero. And once you do that, then business can be as usual. You can grow indefinitely because there's no other service that Mother Nature offers us. And this one service, if you can get, can can keep to the limits, as it what 1.5 or 2 or whatever. Okay, so that's that's in some sense why I'm less than impressed. 
because of course climate regulation is tied up with many other leg- regulation uh, services that mother nature offers us for example um decomposition of waste or uh s- soil regeneration or water cleansing so these are all related services and uh, my biodiversity review was really addressing the the sum of these interlinked services which are not substitutes of each other they're complementary to one another which means that if you press against one heavily the others will start unraveling as well because these are complementary it's a sort of a complex system that the earth system is okay so th- i think the th- that's what makes the economics of biodiversity subsume the economics of climate change and i think one reason people find it difficult to think about the economics of biodiversity is that it is complex and many of these services you people don't have any perception of i mean the average um uh, member of a finance ministry will not know anything about soil regeneration it, uh, ministers of finance don't have ecologists there or soil experts or they have economists of course but they're the last people you would go to to have a depreciation of the inner workings of nature what happens under our feet what happens deep in the forests what happens in the oceans these are the ones which are churning out the services these t- totality of assets are churning out these uh, services uh, which we many you don't know of because you haven't studied them you certainly don't see them these are you know these are processes you don't see them and most often you don't hear them so you have to be sensitive you know to recognize that they're working away and and we are making use of them our own lives depend on the workings of these you know imagine if there is decomposition of waste stopped then you just have piles and piles of waste and it, you know it could be unlivable but this is silent it's being these services are being provided by almost invisible objects fungi bacteria and so forth so i think that may be something like an answer to your question as to why it's fallen behind but the other reason is the standard one uh, each country wants to free ride on the others so the you know unless you have some commitment device you can agree at every cop cop but then go away and get on with your life as usual so it's been a failure and we have now in a way in, even within climate of course we're going to break the 1.5 degree without any sweat and the question is whether it'll be 3 or 4 now people are talking in the long that line and that's terribly dangerous so i think it's two two things as i say there are two things one is more fundamental and the other is standard stuff about negotiation among parties in which each wants to free ride on the others unless you can have agreements which are enforceable i read you saying uh, that one of the uh, weaknesses of the climate change and and, and you you have just said that is a climate change negotiations it looks only at at carbon dioxide and greenhouse gas, gases and not not the uh, uh, not the not the bio, total services ecosystem services in totality uh, sir has the i mean since since the millennium ecosystem assessment and 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 the discipline growing discipline of environment and ecological economics has has the uh, has has the discipline got uh, enough strength to push its argument uh, with with something like the climate change uh, uh, negotiations because part of the problem is some of these don't have tangible you know measurable arguments you know so like we know about pollination but how what do you put how do you put an economic value to pollination so has has that grown in the past few decades to be to be able to be included in the climate change discussions yes it, i think there is there has been a great deal of progress first of all um the measurement issue which is i think you you're quite right to point to it i think we we economists have misled the public in thinking that you um if you can't measure something or if you find it very difficult then you bypass it and uh, it's almost like saying if i can't measure it i'll pretend it's zero <laughs> you know which is a very precise number by the way so that's a, a very t- uh, common tendency on our part um the remember there's a parallel set of cops that run parallel to the climate change one and that's biodiversity there was one in, in egypt only recently and 
I think they made they're making moves in the right direction. They're not saying something silly like let's conserve uh, species. Of course, there'll be some cases where you would say, for example, charismatic species like the gorillas. You want to conserve them because you can see them, they're important, or you think they're important, they're valuable to you, or you feel awful if a whole species like that disappears. So then you want to preserve, to help preserve the habitat in which that species exists. But most species you can't even see. We don't even know how many species there are. I mean, think of insects. There, I mean, for all I you know, we don't know how many millions of insects there are types of in, in terms of species. So the alternative is really is the right one, which is to think in terms of land use. I mean, after all, they're somewhere in the waters or in the la in the lands. And the question is, you have some sort of notion of the um, prevalence of species in different types of land, temperate zones. Uh, I mean, say in different types of ecosystems. Sorry, uh, more, more accurately, different types of ecosystems, whether it's grasslands or whether it's wetlands, whether it's coastal fisheries or or, or whatever. And I think the latest COP was right in uh, thinking in terms of preservation of uh, the assets as measured in terms of space. The thirty percent, thirty percent rule, which they uh, is in the air now, is in that direction. It's, that is in that direction. It's not, it's, it would be stupid to say, if we do that, we'll protect so many percentage of, 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 of uh, insects because um, it, it's, or, or other, other uh, categories of, of, of species because you don't know where they're located or how they're distributed in the location. So I think the, Preserving habitats is a very good move. That's the right move to make. So now the question is then you say, how do you value that habitat? Absolutely right. And it's a good question to ask, but I think it would be specious to think that we can value them easily. We can't do that easily. Uh, we could talk to ecologists to talk about the con physical consequences of habitat losses. We economists like to think that we have to give a value, and we have encouraged the public to think that we have to give a monetary value without which we cannot discuss anything. But typically, um, say if you go to a um, doctor, medical doctor with the health problem, if the diagnosis will be in terms of a characteristics of what will happen if you don't do this or if you don't do that. So it will be in terms of the function, the, your, your bodily functions. And you have to make an assessment of what the consequences that, of that are to your psyche or your ability to earn money or whatever, as the case might be. And I think the best thing we can do when it comes to, and I'll come back to climate, by the way, because the same problem arises there, is you, instead of trying to value, the, the let's say, the um, mangrove forest or a wetland, although they can be valued, by the way, the only trouble is that the value of a wetland in one place is different from the value of a wetland in another place, depending on where, where it's located. So in a way, you're, the indicators are going to be quantitative in terms of quality of the landscape itself as to whether it's a healthy uh, wetland or a not healthy wetland. Now, take come back to, say, climate change. If you think about the discussion on it, you're thinking of um, the temperature, which is the limit to which you are allowed to go, or you think you shouldn't pop bypass. It, was, it used to be 1.5, right? At the, but that argument was not given on the basis of price. Nobody said that at 1.5, the price of carbon, negative price of carbon would be so many dollars. I mean, lots of people have been estimate, trying to estimate the social cost of carbon, by the way. But that's not how the uh, discussions have been taking place in the COPs. They think in terms of limiting the concentration in the atmosphere, which is related to the mean temperature. And then you work backwards to see what kind of temperature, mean temperature is tolerable that we can actually withstand. And then the cost and benefits of uh, bringing it forward, reducing it, or allowing it to be raised. So the discussions are in, almost invariably in terms of quantities. And quantities of the stuff, in this case, carbon concentration, 
or in the case of ecological resources, assets, it will be about the health of the ecosystems and the variety of ecosystems that are there. All right. I mean, you destroy all the wetlands but keep the coastal fisheries okay, you're in trouble, or vice versa, because they're interconnected. Okay. So we have to do that in that. And that kind of answer analysis can only come from ecologists, the scientists themselves. They can give you a characterization of what kind of services will be at risk if too much pressure is put on a certain category of assets. So I think the discussion needs to be in that form. And that's why I think the 30-30 kind of reasoning, 30%, 30% kind of reasoning is probably the right one to go for. Now, the problem with that, from my point of view, is really that there wasn't very much discussion, as far as I know, but I wasn't privy to the discussions of what happens to the 70%. 70%. Because if you're prohibited from entering 30%, 30%, you might want to shift your resources for exploitation onto the other set, greater burden on the 70 70% than you would otherwise do, which would happen, for example, in a city planning. You... The larger chunk of stuff, land that you say you cannot build, but you want to keep it green, the more people there will be in the places where is, there is no room. So obviously, we'll, and that needs to be, I think that needs to be thought through more carefully. But the main uh, problem I, I feel, I face, I, I feel exists, is the fact that um, ecologists and earth scientists have not been as uh, accommodated in the economic discussions that they should have been, I think. I mean, although, as you say, Millennium Ecosystem Assessment was it's a pioneering piece of work that um, of 2005, it, it alerted us to these services and, and gave a classification, which I found very helpful when I was writing my review and uh, tried to interpret it in a slightly different way. But I think, I think that's the way to go rather than worry about, can you put a monetary value? You can, by the way. In isolate, in exception, in special cases, you can. I mean, wetlands can be valued in terms of the service it provides. Take one simple case. Um, one of the services it provides is cleansing of water, cleaning natural cleaning of water. Now, one way of asking the question: What happens if the um, wetland is destroyed because you say building a housing estate or roads and so forth? Is to say how much would it cost to have a filtration plant? built to, because now the wetland can't offer you that service free of charge as well, okay? Now, when if you look at that price, you can then say, well, at the minimum, that's what it's worth, because if we don't have the wetland, we'll have to build a filtration plant, and that could be billions of dollars, okay? And then you say, well, what else does a wetland do? You talk about pollination, let's say. Well, you can value that, because you can value the productivity losses in in adjacent or neighboring fields, farm fields, agricultural fields. In fact, there have been some very nice work in that direction. One class of work was that was to find that the nearer the farms were to forest, at the edge of forests, the higher the productivity was, other things equal. The idea is pretty straightforward that the these pollinators, they have a range, remember. So they're going to pollinate the neighboring uh, farms more than the ones which are farther distant. And that way you can work out again the productivity. The difference, the differences in the productivity will give you an un understanding of the value of these pollinators to the to the, the product. So there are many, many, many alternative ways of trying to plot to, to tease out the productivity, the, 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 the services in terms of monetary value uh, in uh, of, of these services. And I should say that uh, there is a, a, a excellent um um, NGO called Sandy, South Asian Network for Development and Environmental Economics, which is now currently based in Kathmandu. Now, they've been working for about 23 years or so on precisely these classes of questions. And they've done very, very nice work on valuing, for example, the damage that uh, uh, shrimp farms uh, cause to adjacent um, mangrove forest. You can you can work that out. You can even value the in terms of uh, loss of fisheries and so forth. So there are ways of trying to tease out the productivity benefits of pre preservation of ecological services. Another one coming out from Sandy was the value of mangroves in protecting households against um, 
cyclones and storms. And it was a very ingenious study because what uh, the uh, she did, the investigator did, was to look at a whole sequence of a line of mangrove forests along the eastern seaboard of India in, in Orissa and looked at the status of the um, mangrove, the, the, the quality of the mangrove forest, and plotted that against the damages to households in that. Uh, that took place under a cyclone condition. And she got a lovely fit to show that how mangrove, you can work out from that how the density of mangrove forests are protect against extreme weather events. So there are many ways of doing it. You have to be ingenious, obviously, but it's not, it's not, not possible. But finally, I suspect the reason these cops don't take this too seriously or do not absorb it is that these are very... Uh, um, location-specific valuations. Obviously, a mangrove forest here is diff has a different value from a mangrove forest somewhere else because so many parameter variables are involved here. And uh, so what do you do then? Well, all you what you have to do is just like anything else. You take as many case studies as you can and then notice how it's specific to the location, that is to say the latitude, longitude of the location. Um, and, and other characteristics of, you know, mean temperature and so forth, and then see whether you can use that for general discussions over global issues. But I, I don't think we're starting from zero. There's a lot of work that's already been done. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, sir, uh, in your NC conference lecture in December 2021, you had mentioned that uh, export of primary produce from poor but biodiverse countries in, uh, of the tropics, that's essentially developing countries, um, to the Western countries are at prices that doesn't, don't necessarily re reflect the true, true price of that. So uh, we have one step where there's an inequality built in. Over the last few decades, uh, much of manufacturing has moved from the developed countries to developing countries. Uh, at, that's the second step. But now the, the now, now, you know, like the European Union has declared this carbon border adjustment mechanism, which is basically a carbon tax, you know, so that they can load a carbon tax on steel from India, etc. So uh, how how does this? I mean, so how? I mean, isn't this some kind of a double whammy that's that's coming in? I mean, one you have this loss for developing countries, and and then you are loaded with uh, with barriers uh, which are coming into the uh, negotiations. So what kind of barriers do you have in mind? I didn't quite follow that. I haven't been keeping uh, the, the carbon carbon border adjustment mechanism, which EU has just announced. That means if they were to import steel from India, uh, mm -hmm. because they say that the steel manufacturing in India does not meet the their standards of uh, carbon emissions emission reduction, so 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 uh, there, there would be a, some kind of an import duty on on that. So so I mean, at two or three levels, you have this. Uh, inequity built in first at first the production stage, then moving the manufacturing to developing countries, and then now having an entry barrier for products from developing countries. So, right. Uh, okay, fair enough. So the, I appreciate what you're getting at. Now coming to the latter part, that's something that I've been much concerned about because there hasn't been much work done on it because it wasn't noticed. I think the export of primary products does in, involve external internal external externalities that is exporting countries externalities within those countries such that they're underpriced um, it's, that's pretty straightforward i mean if you're uh, let's say just for the sake of argument you exporting shrimps uh, and from shrimp farms well the damage that the shrimp farms are causing your local uh, communities that's not included in the price by definition and if it's not included in the price, that means you're under underpricing it. And underpricing it means that you attached to your export is a wealth transfer from the exporting country to the in, importing country. Nobody notices it because your national accounts don't include it. Nobody even notices that that's happening. It's a very silent subsidy that poor countries are giving, making. It's not even a subsidy. It's just basically a wealth transfer, as simple as that. Okay. Once you know that something should should happen, how should and what will happen? I do not know, because the country, in, in, the country, particular country in question, would say, "Well, look, we can't afford to do this because if we do that, we lose the market, and our neighboring country is not is going to export it." 
Okay, if we ban, let's say Sri Lanka says it's going to ban ban or or if they raise the price of export, that would be the better thing. Naturally, they ought to they shouldn't necessarily ban it, but compensate the damages and therefore raise the price when they export. If that happens, they might lose that market entirely and somebody else will pick it up. That will be the argument. So the answer really needs to be that these countries need to get together and have a coordinated tax policy, export tax policy, because they will all gain. Remember, the harm they're doing is to themselves, not to outsiders. So that's once you notice the direction of harm, you, there is a policy wait, you know, staring at you in the face. So that's one thing. As regards the carbon thing, that's a much trickier one. Either you buy the fact that there is a, there is a, a, a climate problem and therefore we need to reduce the um, emission. If you do, then either you say, well, we are going to cut our emissions a lot more so that you can continue um, emitting and therefore we won't tax, you know, impose a... Uh, it attacks on your uh, on your exports because we are compensating our, ourselves for the harm you are doing, so that the global emission doesn't change. That would be the right thing to do, I think. Obviously, it should be the right thing to do. It's not going to happen, so it's not much point in complaining about it because the UK or the United States or the EU are not going to say, "Well, look, we are going to overcompensate. We have moved our production to your side. We are going to be buying steel from you. You are polluting." At a higher rate than we would have if we were producing it. But we may be saving money by lower manufacturing costs or whatever, and therefore you have it. But we will compensate by reducing our emissions so that the global emission doesn't uh, add up to the same amount. That would be the right solution. But uh, I don't, I'm not sure that's going to happen. Also, in the same lecture, you had mentioned about the, uh, I mean, while in the process of transfer of wealth, and you, you said it just now. The, the the developing countries themselves are sort of uh, destroying their own ecosystems, yes. you know. Yeah. And some of these ecosystems are global commons, you know, the forests of uh, Brazil Amazon or Congo or the ice in Indian Himalayas are not not just national properties any longer. I mean, they they are global commons, you know. So yeah. so at one level, uh, uh, they they don't get paid for the loss that's happening to their their ecosystem uh, and ecosystem services. But but at the other level, uh, after the Paris Agreement, you know, every every country has emissions trading. At least before Paris, it was uh, it it was I mean uh, it was in that sense uh, that common but ref- differentiated responsibilities. Developing countries didn't have targets. Now every every country has some kind of a target, self-imposed, but targets emission re- reduction targets. So uh, is isn't this some kind of a inequitous situation? And uh, uh, is there any way that this can be? this can be corrected through economic interventions? Yeah, I, that's a very good question. The, uh, I've gone into that quite a bit in the review myself because there's a, the, the point, the examples you're talking about, giving now about the, say, the rainforests of Brazil, just take that as one country. Now, the argument goes even from, obviously, for Indonesia um, and then the rest of Latin America, which house the Amazon forest. But let's talk about just keep it to Brazil, just for the sake of argument. That case is different from the one we've been discussing just now about shrimp farms. And the reason is that the shrimp farms externality is local. It's affecting neighboring um, mangrove and neighboring natural, um, let's say, neighboring mangrove forest, and therefore the nurseries uh, that are being supported by the mangroves. Okay, So you're damaging your local fishery. Okay. Now, in the case of the the um, Amazon rainforest, there are many, many ills of deforestation there. But the point, key point that you're mentioning is that you're mentioning that yourself is that these rainforests are actually a global public good. They're providing a service which is not exclusive to Brazil, but to the world as a whole. But on the other hand, they are not like the atmosphere or the oceans. They're nat- within national jurisdiction. I mean, oceans, when I meant, is the beyond the EEZ. That, uh, these forests are within national jurisdiction. So Brazil can rightly say that the incentive we have to protect the rainforests is smaller than the global incentives, because we will, of course, lose, but we'll only lose a bit. The rest of you will also lose because it's a global public good. Everybody is in, enjoying the benefits of 
So therefore, we have fewer incentives, lower incentives. I'm assuming that you're having a rational discourse, okay? We are not talking about the previous president of Brazil who would say, who, you know, you wouldn't trust it, a word of what he says. That's not, I'm assuming that they're being an honest broker, okay? And they're saying, look, what am I to do? What are we to do? We have to develop. You like beef, you like soya beans, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, soya. And so we, we're converting our uh, forest into plantations and and uh, beef beef farms, and you are enjoying the benefits of that. And we are of course losing our rainforests, um, but the price we are paying for the loss of the rainforest is lower than the price that the world is paying for the loss of the rainforest because it's a global public good. So therefore, what's the answer? The answer is quite, to me, absolutely transparent. The world ought to be paying Brazil not to deforest. It's like paying for an ecosystem services, which within nations is becoming a commonplace now. Uh, you know, governments pay farmers uh, to leave land fallow, for example, to regime date or build hedgerows in order to attract birds, to, to raise the, uh, the biodiversity and so forth. And it's happening now all over the world, actually. China is practicing it, England's practicing it, United, United States even. Uh, Costa Rica is, of course, very advanced in that. So if, if I have a water, you know, water passes by my land and I, if uh, I'm paid to, to, to husband it for the next, uh, my neighbors, and I am, I'm paid because otherwise it's, a, in a property, it's in my property and I don't quite have the incentive not to do what I wish to do and I need to be paid for it. So th this would be the clear way of doing it, which would be to compensate, compensate them pay. Uh, pay pay Brazil as opposed to moaning about Brazil losing so much of, uh, you know, the size of Portugal disappears every other year from Brazil. And it's absolutely aston and astonishing. We are seeing it in our own life. It's happening. But I think the policy there is pretty straightforward. It's not happening. Obviously, it's not happening. But it ought to happen. Um, sometimes some people, individuals buy up pieces of uh, rainforest and then preserve them. But that's small beer. This has to happen at a major level, scale of operation. Uh, I, would, I used to think that maybe the World Bank or the I, you know, World Bank would be a mediator in, in that direction, that it could actually negotiate with Brazil, let's say, or any other country to see how to halt the degradation of the forest and how much would be. It would require negotiation, of course. There'll be a lot of bargaining, uh, but goes that that's part of life. You have to do that. But that's way that that's the way to go. That's quite different from the shrimp farm case, by the way. That's I want to make that clear. So uh, may I may I bring this uh, discussion from I mean somewhere in between the shrimp uh, shrimp farm and 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 the Brazil's rainforest uh, at a slightly national scale. Uh, we we just had this uh, uh, report from uh, uh, FAO on the state of food and agriculture. Uh, this year, and then it talks about different countries, how much is the hidden cost uh, that agriculture, uh, hidden cost in agriculture. And it says India has had one, uh, in year 2020, India had, had uh, US dollar 1.2 trillion as, as uh, hidden cost. And now with a population of 1.4 billion, I mean, India's, uh, much of India's food production is, is con consumed domestically. Uh, so, I mean, and, and you can't raise food prices, because that's a politically sensitive issue, you know, because if you were to get real prices for food, that will cost, that will cost riots, you know, so, so how, how, how can you sort of uh, balance this? Are there uh, in interventions possible, mechanisms possible where the farmers also get a fair price and, and the food uh, gets? The, the, the 1.2 trillion that you quoted is what? Is the hidden cost, the environmental cost, is it? Environmental oh, cost. Your cost for health, cost on health, environmental cost, etc. I mean, which doesn't get reflected in the market price. Sure, absolutely. I, I, you know, the answer to that is, I mean, it's a hard answer, but I mean, it, you can't escape it, which is if you had your national accounts in terms of, you know, the, fact, the depreciation of natural capital, which is accompanying food production, if you had that staring at you in the face, it's for India to decide how to handle it. It's, I, I don't think there is any... Uh, it's, it's no use pretending that the problem doesn't exist. The problem exists because it's going to hit India. So 
it's a it, it's a tension that is very very uh, the tension between the poor now and the rich now on the one hand two groups let us say the well off and the not well off the producer who are not necessarily very well off but some are and people in the future and depreciation natural capital is going to be hurting the future not today just like any depreciation does so you have to make a decision as to how you make the balance you know the the trade offs between tomorrow's people today's people and then within today's people between the two types or three types of people you have and then there'll be two or three types tomorrow as well by the way so any reasonable planning model economic model of the food sector should have time built in plus the asset quality of the assets built in and recognize that you have a portfolio problem in which you manage the asset various assets in a way that you have, you manage to 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 meet some of the problems today and some of the problems tomorrow and the problems between today and tomorrow and tomorrow because it's one thing to say, well, we can't afford to do anything because you know, the farmers have to live, poor can't be priced, and therefore what we do is to next decade hand over far worse land to the future in a decade's time, to the then future. If you do that, if you put it in stark way, you'll have to find some method of financing this, uh, I mean, the, the, these trade-offs. What's happening is that we don't believe in these trade-offs because many of these assets are under un, are not reported in the statistics. So I don't see, I mean, it's a hard choice, I know, but then that's tough. That's how it is. But it is a tough, it's, all these ch choices are tough. But to, you, I mean, the idea that you can't hurt this group, you can't hurt that group, and you can't hurt another group, but we want to continue with our production possibilities and without harming the land. That's not on. That, that's the wrong arithmetic. So it seems to me that you know that's one of those. These trade-offs need to be faced by the decision makers, and the, but the models don't give those trade-offs, except that you've just now said that FAO has produced this figure. Is FAO? Did you say it was FAO? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Let's just for the sake of argument assume that that the figure is is approximately, you know, okay, it's a ballpark figure, at least it's giving you a magnitude of how, how much harm you're doing to your, uh, the aquifers and the, uh, you know, d d uh, the, the amount of the decline in the aquifers volume uh, capacity, as well as the land quality and so forth. Yeah, these are choices that we have to make. It's, it's as simple as that. We ha happen to have a huge population. That's a re relic of the past. And, um, these are choices that are we have faced. It's, there's no answer to it. You, there's there's no magic bullet because you there isn't a magic bullet. There's a trade-off issue here. Yeah. Thank you very much for your time and uh, pleasure. We, yeah, and we really look forward to uh, the 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 discipline growing and we being as journalists being able to do uh, more and more writing on environmental economics. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much indeed. It's a pleasure to meet you. Take care.